Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Playbook. Uh, this week's feature guest is Jenny Weimer. Jenny, how are you doing? I am awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having awesome. me. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, we're excited to have you and hear a little bit about your story. I know you're doing big things in Orlando, so I know the audience is probably super stoked to kind of hear your story, how you got started and, and kind of where you're at today and, you know, the journey and how you were able to get where you're at. Well, buckle up. It's been a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So for the people out there. It's an old dog here, so it's a long story. <laughs> so for the people out here who might not be too familiar with your background, Jenny, why don't you tell me a little bit about kind of how you got started, you know, um, in real estate, those initial years, the growing pains, and how you ended up where you are today. Okay. Well, you know, I think it, I think it's important for me to go back and just say, you know, out of college, um, I became a teacher. I was a seventh grade science teacher. I did that for seven years, loved it. Um, I was good at it, but I just wasn't fulfilled. And in my twenties, you know, I started to learn about myself, and and I, you know, through personality profiles and such, I realized I am a one trick pony. I am influencer, and that's it, really. And so I'm like, I really need to be selling something. And um, I needed that immediate feedback. I couldn't wait until my kids graduated, you know, 10 years later to come back and tell me I was awesome, you know, because I really needed like that immediate feedback. So I realized I, realized I should be selling something. And I thought, well, what should I be selling? And uh, both my father's broker, um, my, my father and my stepfather were both broker owners as I was growing up. So I thought, well, I'll sell real estate. And I thought, well, I'll just do it part-time, you know, when, uh, cause I'm a teacher. So I have my summers, weekends, you know, and I went into real estate class and she was telling me about what her, one of her agent, you know, the teacher was telling me about what one of her agents was doing. I'm like, I could do that. I could do that. And um, I came home to my husband who at the time was a CPA. Um, and I said, I think I would just want to really do this full time. And he's like, I go for it, you know, which was what a blessing. And, um, so I dove in and did it. And my first year in real estate, I sold 50 homes and, um, wow. Five yeah. Zero? yeah, yeah. But you know, it was, um, in Houston and they were $40,000. So I had to sell 50 homes <laughs> <Yeah. Absolutely. laughs> to make a living, you know, so. Um, but, you know, I think back to those days, I mean, this was back in 19, nine, this is 90, or two, wait, 1999, I was licensed. So this is back when, you know, the computers still had DOS on them and there was no cloud and there was no um, MapQuest. I used an Atlas to drive around, you know, and, and we, I mean, it was just crazy. So anyway, um, I, I started in real estate, got the 50 transactions. I had, no one ever told me that was good, that that was like rookie of the year material, you know, like I turned in my first contract and the, um, the, the girl at the front desk goes, oh, good job. Wait till you start doing three or four months. And I was like, oh, is that, is that the bar? Is that what we're supposed yeah. to do? And so I went and sold for a month. I mean, because that's yeah. then somebody put that on me, right? Right. And and I didn't get a celebration at the end. I just got really good paychecks, and I was proud of my business. Yeah. Um, so um, you know, after that, and I I will say I'll credit my husband back in the day. Like he really got me started because I started selling homes to everybody in his firm. You know, he and that really kind of launched me at that point in that career. Um, we had our triplets. We moved to Orlando. And I had to start over. And um, I was like, okay, well, how am I going to do this? You know, and I don't know anybody here at all. And so what prompted, what prompted the move, Jenny? Well, Texas is like an island, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And my family was from Michigan and had migrated to Florida. Okay. And um, I thought, you know, no, with our kids and it's going to be difficult to travel um, there's no way our family is ever coming to Texas. You know, Texas. <laughs> if I want to see my five brother or four brothers and sisters, I'm going to have to, you know, go, we're going to have to get closer to the parents and we're going to need support with the babies. And so we moved to, we took a, a transfer with Mike's, um, Deloitte and Touche at the time. And, uh, we got to Orlando. My family's in South Florida, but close enough where we could get support, you know, and uh, so here we are with the babies and I'm like, well, I want to, I want to sell real estate. I wasn't, I could have stayed at home, but I had a, um, we had a live-in nanny and um, 
I needed, I need my ADD needs to be doing something. I, I'm not mm -hmm. Susie Homemaker. <laughs> and so um, I, you know, thought, well, how can I build this business around our life? And so I just put the kids in a stroller, the little the triplet stroller and went around the neighborhood and met the neighbors, started, you know, baby groups, started bunco groups, started play, anything for me to get out of the house, mm -hmm. but to build a community in my community. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I did that with, you know, me selling real estate. And I got up in the first couple of years, I thought I would just sell in that neighborhood a few and that would be my real estate career, right? You know, until the kids went to school. Um, but it took off way faster than I thought it would. And I got up to 80% market share in the 400 homes um, in 2005. Oh, that's insane. I know 80%, right? That's, and it was yeah, just because I was... Level. I was building a community I wanted to live in is really mm -hmm. what it boiled down to, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that formula works. I was doing you know, events in the community. I was doing a newsletter to the community because we needed a way to communicate. And so I duplicated that and went to a second community. And so I had built two farms. They were both 400 homes each. And you know that got me to about 30 million in production, you know, a few staff members and assistants and such, and we can go back to that. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the market changed. Like we went into REO and uh, short sales and all of that in 2007 and eight. And um, so farming was harder because we didn't have the control over who's choosing an agent because the banks were choosing. Um, and we also had at that time, um, Realtor.com and Zillow coming online. And so, you know, our old ways of work, selling real estate still work, you know, direct mail, mm -hmm. networking, communicate, you know, but I realized with the digital revolution coming in, I needed to protect my farms digitally too. So when they go online, do they see me there as well as the newsletter and the signs in the community? And so I really started with, um, you know, the um, leads, you know, pro, like Realtor.com and Zillow in defense versus offense. And um, all of a sudden the phone starts ringing and we have too many leads. And, you know, that, that what a great problem to have. And that mm -hmm. continues to be the problem. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> I mean, that's how we've built a business. We've just, we hire when we have too many leads, when we have too many agents, we hire admin when we have, you know, and it, it's just a kind of rinse and repeat situation after that. Yeah. Um, but we never hire until we know we can feed another family. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where we ended up. And, and it, you know, at, in 2010, my husband, um, you know, he was about to buy in as a partner in a, in a CPA firm. And he said, you know, um, should I, you know, he was thinking, should I do this? You know, blah, blah, it was a big move. And our kids were, you know, um, a little bit, they have some special needs and they were, they were, they need a lot of attention. And um, we both needed the flexibility that this world provides. And um, he's like, you know, I'm just, I feel like I could come over and run your business, right? Like I was at a point where I was maxed out at what I knew about business. I could care less about a PL statement. I just want uh -huh. to work with the people, right? And um, he came over and I remember him saying to me in 2010, um, so you're telling me if I write a check for $2,000 to Zillow, you can't sell one house? I'm like, yes. And he's like, <laughs> why aren't we buying more of this? You know, like, yeah. I'm like, uh, duh, because it hurts yeah. to write the check, right? Like you feel like it's coming out of your account. And so- yeah. But he is a businessman and he mm -hmm. understands like the the return on investment and all of that. Mm -hmm. right? And so plus, plus too, everybody back then, if we go back to 10 or 11, everybody, I think, in the real estate sector was frowning upon buying leads. It wasn't as acceptable as it is now. So you were made to feel like an outcast if you're actually spending money on lead generation. Right, right. And so we did that and he came in and it, he just took the lid off our business. Right. So we you know, I, I think I got it to about 30 million. And I was maxed and it was, I had a lid on it because I couldn't do anymore. I just didn't know what I didn't know. I, I, I just, I wasn't a business person. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's that rocket fuel piece. You need that next implementer or whatever that is. But um, 
So we, we took off from there um, and we it's sort of rinse and repeat from there. And here we are at 1,040 transactions, 340 million this year. So numbers I never thought I would see in my lifetime, to be honest, like it's crazy. That's insane. Well, congratulations on your yeah. success. I remember back in the day, this would have been, I don't know, I don't know the exact date, so don't hold me to it, but 14, 15, 16, like we were at Keller Williams and, um, you know, we were kind of up and coming at the time and in the North region. And obviously we're very competitive and every month we're trying, they get the statistics coming out. We're trying to get number one. And every month it's Weimar group, Weimar group, Weimar group. <laughs> so when you finally went independent, which was prior to us, we were like, finally, we can get to the top. Cause I know you guys were kind of dominating that sector for so long. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So um, now you were, as far as starting with the brokerage, I know obviously you were with Keller Williams and then you went independent. Where did you first go with Keller when you moved to Orlando or were you with somebody else at that time? No, I started with a, uh, what was it? It was like GMAC or something. Um, it was 2003, but, um, okay. and I, I, you know, they were, they were really sweet people. The manager was so nice. And, um, but I remember they brought the CEO in or something to talk to us. And um, I was sitting around the table and I, you know, I had done 50 trans. I mean, I was like a producer, right? But I was new there. So I didn't feel like I could negotiate anything. So I walked in and I, you know, I think I was like on a 60, 40 split or something as an indie agent. Um, and I, and it was fine with that. Like, uh, you know, I was paying for the name and, but I, I um, the, the CEO came in and I asked him a question. I said, you know, if I'm sitting across the room, uh, the table at a closing with the top producer, what would you say the value proposition is to a top producer? And I meant that genuinely mm -hmm. because I, I, uh, I like to share things with people. I want, I want to, I want to attract, you know, good people into my world. And he, he like blew up. He's like, all oh, you agents, all you want is money. All you want is da, 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 da. And I was like, Oh, um, that didn't feel good. <laughs> and so I'm like, if that's your value proposition, you know, like, I think I'm at the wrong place. So then I went to Caldwell Banker because I had a couple friends there and I, I moved in, got settled and realized, what did I just do? This is way too corporate for me. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to ask for every move I make. I want to be able to make some independent decisions in my business. I want to be able to, you know, market my brand. And I thought, I just made a move. How can I make another move? I'm going to look so bad. So I, I rolled that out for like a, a year. And then um, KW came in and recruited all my buddies out of Cobble Banker. And they mm -hmm. didn't recruit me because they thought, well, she'll never go because, you know, she's, she's, you know, whatever. And I was yeah. like, take me. I was like, I'm yeah, going to take me with you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so um I ended up at KW and then you know I I mean I, I loved KW I really and I still do I, I bleed red my heart is there um I we would have stayed there if we could we just got to when we left KW and did our own indie brokerage we were up to about 500 transactions you know 40 wow. 40 team members um we just ran out of ladder you know I think mm -hmm. that they fix that these days they have some different options but um, at the time when, if we had to go do our own building and our own everything, it, the, the finances just didn't make sense. You know, yeah. the value, there was just a value, um, seesaw there. So, um, we decided it was sort of like we grew up and went to college, you know? And so I still recruit to KW because I, you know, we can't take everybody. We don't hire right. everybody. But KW is a great place to launch. And yeah, so absolutely. I still take advantage of it my our old relationships there. Oh, awesome. So I know one thing you kind of touched on is your when you started farming. So you had one community started an 80% market share, 400 homes, and then you segued into another one, 400 homes. Um, now, I know, obviously, you were building communities and community, and you were trying to do a lot of face to face and kind of build relationships with your neighbors. Just for the audience out there who might be curious on how to build a farm, and obviously I know a lot of things have probably changed since then, like you talked about the digital footprint. What were some other things, if they're curious, that you went into your farming besides the face-to-face -face interaction? Like, um, you know, the, the cadence of a newsletter, was it monthly? Were you sending out postcards? What exactly were you doing in that farm? Yeah. 
So I think whenever you choose to mark, you know, like I, I, I was telling somebody yesterday, I'm like, you, if you're going to put money behind marketing, right, you want to make sure you're getting a return. But it, some of this stuff is long term. You've got to go in and commit to it for at least a year to two years or, you know, you, you give up and you waste your money. But it's super important to layer. So, you know, if there if I'm going to market to this community, I also need to be there digitally. I also like, you know, where do they shop or where do they um, go to events? So if I'm going to do an event, I'm going to do it like at that complex that is going to attract the people from this community. You know, so if I'm going to do a taste of anything or a whatever, you know, I'm going to build, put my tent up where I'm going to, the people who have seen my newsletter, who have seen my ads, who have seen me on Facebook are going to also see me there, right? Because that's layering and it cements that relationship. Um, so I always try to encourage people, whatever you do, have a plan to layer. Um, what you don't want to do is send out a just sold card to 20 different neighborhoods and never send them another thing. What a waste right. of money. Yeah, um, absolutely. Right. And so, um, or like the home and garden show down at the uh, convention center, like who you're going to see them for two seconds and they'll never think of you again, you know, so mm -hmm. just making good choices. And, um, but we did a monthly newsletter. We still do to this day. Um, it is black and white on yellow paper, you know, it's, and then, and I was too cheap to mail. Um, I hire a high school student to deliver them on a monthly basis and they just put them in the doors. Um, you know, it's just something, I mean, you know, can we do it now? Yes. <laughs> we could be in color, but it doesn't, we, it doesn't need to be what they want to see is what are homes selling in their community for and what is their home worth? You know, nobody mm -hmm. gets a statement on their home every month. Mm -hmm. So to them, it's, and they file them away, you know, like, um, you know, and especially back in the day, they couldn't see students. Now that if, you know, they can, they can get some data online, but, um, you know, they like to see what, what's going on around them and everything yeah. else in the newsletter doesn't matter. It's the, back with, with the comps, that's all it yeah. is. And I believe too, even though if they can find the data, when it comes to the newsletter, they like something tangible, just a mm -hmm. quick reference. Like they like that piece of paper. And I'm sure, you know, I haven't run listing appointments in a couple of years now, but back when I was in production, you know, I would go on those listing appointments and they'd pull out the manila folder and there's your stack of newsletters from like five yeah. or six years. So people yeah. do send them and they do save them. And that kind of shows you of how long you got to drip and market to them. And it's not just something that's going to be overnight. I always look at Farming is building your business and don't expect overnight success, but stay purposeful with it, like you said, and you can build a sustainable business. Yes, absolutely. So. Absolutely. And it, you're building that database. So no matter absolutely. what, you're adding people to a database. You can do that through farming. You can do it through networking. You, I mean, there's a million ways to do it, right? But, you know, I always tell our agents, you know, you've got the low hanging fruit. You've got the Zillow leads, the Realtor.com leads or whatever you're doing. Low hanging fruit. You go work the now business but you do something every day to move your business forward in marketing or branding or, you know, like your niche. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it, it's, those are incremental moves and, in, you know, just start something and stick with it because mm -hmm. it works if you stick with it. It's just consistency. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. So we're going to kind of segue into market conditions, kind of talk a little bit about your market, what you're experiencing. I know, you know, you're selling primarily in the Orlando area and, you know, outlying areas um, and very similar market conditions to Tampa. So I guess, what are some of the market, you know, conditions like, you know, how aggressive are you seeing home selling your market? Are there still constantly bidding wars? And what do you project in the Orlando market for 2022? Pure chaos yep. for 2022 is what I predict. Um, it's, and I'm not intimidated by it, to be honest. I think, um, you know, it's the, the cream always rises to the top. So like we will, as long as we focus on mastery and um, relationships in the marketplace, we will win, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, th that goes to say like, you know, we have worked very hard on our reputation over the years in that pace. So, you know, every person we add to our team, we uh, tell them, listen, you, every conversation you have out there, every 
interaction you have with any anybody in this industry, you are representing all 80 of us now, you know, and every bridge counts. And it does because we're writing offers, it matters. Absolutely. And so we protect that so much. Um, but I do think that, you know, we're going to have to write highly competitive offers. We're going to have to be really good at consulting our clients. We need to know um, what risks we can take and, um, you know, what, where we're putting clients at risk and have them make those decisions. Um, and we are going to have to be fast. And if we are waiting for properties to come on the MLS, we are going to be one of the masses. So mm -hmm. we have to go generate the listings. We need to know where the hidden inventory is and we need to uncover them every day. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's going to be a game of off market to win. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, we're seeing that here. And I think it's like you said, it's just having that transparency with the client, having that more of a consultant role, letting them know all the pitfalls of all the contingencies, but Hey, if you're comfortable with this risk, if you want to win this house, it might take this, but if you're not comfortable, then obviously we can look at other options. And I think it's just, you know, being that, you know, uh, advocate for your client and making sure that they're aware of all the, the pitfalls, making sure ESCO, you know, is safe, or if they are worried about it, then they can make educated and informed decisions once advised. Yeah. So. And it's because, you know, it scares me out there sometimes when I see these contracts where they're waiving appraisal, waiving inspections, mm -hmm. the clients just don't even know what they've signed. I mean, it's really risky. And uh, oh, yeah, so, we, yeah, we we just had one. Now, I don't know. I've never personally seen this, but it, it just made the news if you kind of Google it yesterday. But there was an investor. He was in another market and off Bayshore Boulevard in Tampa. He just bought a $3.2 million house sight unseen. And he's throwing it back on the market for $9 because he says he'll be able to make a million within like three to six months based on his projections. So that is like, it just made headlines. I think on Yahoo, I was reading on yesterday. And that just kind of lets you know, I think how insane and aggressive the market is. And some of these investors, not all of them are going to win, but a lot of them are taking crazy bets. And obviously they're coming in with plenty of cash. Yeah. So. And interesting you say that too, is uh, luxury is a focus for our, for us this year. Um, I used to avoid it like the plague because they would sit there forever and, you know, yeah. so I mean, it's, but now they're like, they don't even hit the market. They're so, they're going yeah. so quickly. And it's insulated from the, you know, um, open doors and offer pads and home lights, you know? Yeah. And I mean, we're up against them constantly in the, you know, the mid range market. And um, so we're, we're trying to put a heavy focus on luxury this year too. Yeah, absolutely. And I have noticed that it seems like you said that those homes move quicker. And then I think with so many people relocating from the state, you know, if they're cashing in from New York or Jersey or PA, Michigan, Ohio, wherever they're migrating down from, then they kind of see our home prices and they're like, hey, we can kind of swing this. So you see that we've seen in our market, a lot of people kind of come in with cash and buying those, you know, waterfront properties, lakefront properties, acreage properties, and those estate homes, which usually you're looking at about a 12, 14 month cycle on average, you know, when it was a, a normal healthy market. So yeah. we've definitely noticed that change is something that we're focusing on as well. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm going to kind of shift a little bit instead of agent focus, leadership focus, because I think one thing a lot of broker owners, team leaders kind of struggle with is getting buy-in from the agents. And one of the things that you kind of mentioned that, you know, kind of triggered me to inquire was where you're kind of having the agents build this community and you're kind of preaching uh, through what you experience and your results to get the engagement from your agents to do the same. I know that's something that a lot of leaders struggle with in organizations, because most of the time, if you have a team edge such as you have, or a team um, that they're just kind of have their hand out waiting for leads, right? They're usually just kind of waiting to be fed and not really out hunting. What is something that you and your husband, Mike, were able to kind of do, I don't want to say persuade, but get the buy-in from the agents to allow them to follow in your footsteps and create, um, you know, have ways to create that business where regardless of any market condition, they're always going to flourish. Yeah. So I think it's important. Um, we, we, I've always, I'm still an agent at heart. And so whenever we make a decision, we try to put ourselves in the agent's shoes and we ask ourselves like, what feels fair? What would, what would I be attracted to? What would I want to, um, you know, be rewarded for, or what, what do I want out of a brokerage? And so we've kind of always just taken that approach. And, 
And you, you build that one step at a time, you build that bank of trust. Um, and, you know, I'm proud to say that we have over, I think we have 32 of our staff or our, our team members that have been with us for more than five years. So wow. they, they, they stay and they are growing businesses and they're proud of them. It's important for you, like, I, I think a team leader to develop their value proposition and then not just talk the talk, but walk the walk, right? So Mike and I wake up every day and ask ourselves, are we doing what we said we would do for our agents? And our agents are our clients because they mm -hmm. take care of our clients, right? So mm -hmm. um, are we doing what we can to allow them to hit their goals and, um, and they get to choose their goals? I think that's a big mistake where people put goals on agents. Like mm -hmm. we don't pit them against each other. There's there's no competition internally. There's no leaderboard. Everybody has their own whys. And as long as we are together and you know we can control the opportunity, I don't need everybody to be robots, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so um, our agents have the ability to work their business. If they're going to take a vacation, they just turn the faucet off for a minute. And then when they come back on, they turn it back on. You know I mean? We have a benefit of being big enough to be able to do that now. Um, but I, I do think like recently, you know, we realized the market's shifting a little bit in, in, um, models out there. Um, you know, there, I think in the next two years, we're going to see, a lot of the leads have um, large referral fees attached to them, you know, because, you know, if ZillowRealtor.com get their acts together, it's going to be a 35% referral on top of everything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so my husband and I proactively, not because of, you know, anybody complaining about it, just said, we need to adjust our splits to be able to accommodate that and make it so that our agents can still make the money that they need we're still getting what we need out of the business and, you know, build, build something that people won't feel like that they need to leave to go get something better, you know? Right. Um, and we just keep asking ourselves that over and over. And we, we take care of our, our people, you know, mm -hmm. they're not robots to us. They're not, I think when I'm watching, you know, young agents or not young agents, but like agents building young teams um, that they tend to be like, what are you going to do for me? This is, I am the rainmaker and you are working for me. I want you to give me 12 hours a day. I want you to, you know, when it shifts to what can I do to serve you? That's when I think things start to stick, you know, because mm -hmm. you're genuinely concerned about feeding their families. Absolutely. You know, you're, you're not trying to get them to feed yours, you know? Right. Um, and I think that makes a big difference. And we've just always looked at it like that. Yeah, and one of the main things you touched on a big aha and something that we have always done as well is not where we're kind of force feeding the goals. I think that's very important. And a lot of team leaders, you know, they'll have like, hey, we want to hit these numbers. Um, let's call it 50 million in volume. And they have five agents. So they're giving them each 10 million if they're kind of spreading across the board rather than getting what their goal is. That way they're going to be accountable and own kind of what they're setting out to do. And then you as the group leader just need to feel the deficiency on what your goal is. So you, hey, if you're looking at this volume and the five guys are looking to do 30 million, then just go find another 20 million in production from other agents and let them set their own goals. Because everybody's going to have, you know, different life. They're going to have different responsibilities and honestly, different goals. Some are going to aspire to light the world on fire and real estate. Others, it might be a means to put money on the table because they're more passionate about something else. And it's just like you said, making the age of the focal point rather than you having the mindset and almost the ego of thinking that they kind of need you more than you need them type of thing. Right, right, 100%. And you know, not everybody has the same capacity. And I think yeah. we make a mistake thinking everybody can run as fast as us. I don't need everybody to run as fast as me. You know, like if you were gonna do two a month, that's great. I, yeah. you know, and if you're, if you want to do 10 a month, okay, great, let's do it. I don't, and you know, I don't have to hire as many agents. It's just, <laughs> you know, like if you, and it's just, you know, if we have more leads and we can't put anybody in open houses, we, you know, like we need to hire. And um, it's, I mean, it really is kind of simple that way. Yep. But when we're trying to make everybody a machine, you know, mm -hmm. doing two a month is hard. Yeah. And, um, or, you know, like, and I'm okay with one a month, to be honest, because if they're making the money they need to make and they're good team members and they're showing up, 
great. Why? Absolutely. Why is that a problem? You know, like mm-hmm. I don't need them to do two a month. Um, 100%. Or, yeah. Yeah. So I, I completely agree. As far as, and you can touch on yourself, Jenny, or you can t- speak more to your organization. If somebody were to kind of work with you or with your organization, what would you say the biggest strength or the number one attribute for you or your company would be in kind of working with the Weimer group or, or Jenny herself? I think, um, you know, we, we truly work as a team and is supportive where I think a lot of, you know, it's lonely out there. Even if you're on a, a team or, or an individual agent, you're kind of on an island and, you know, how do you go on vacation? How do you leave your phone? To, how do you put your phone down? You know, like, how do you have a life? Um, you know, to, and so I think just having the team around you and the collective wisdom is one big value prop. Um, but two, we've always just asked our agents to get really good at working with the clients. And we right. try to cover everything else. Everything else. So they don't have to go learn how to do SEO and worry about marketing and social media and the, you know, they they do their own Facebook, but they, you know, like they don't have to be experts in everything. They need to be experts in serving the clients. And mm-hmm. And so out of a hundred things that an indie agent has to do, they have to do about eight. And then when they get to a ceiling, just like, you know, any uh, top producer, we help them leverage. So maybe that's an assistant that they need or a showing partner or a buyer agent, you know, and, and each, each agent's different because they have different strengths and, and they need to, you know, leverage different things. So um, it's not a, it, you know, they, it's, we just stay hyper-focused on customer service and serving our database. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't take our eye off that database. You know, 50% of our, our business is repeat referral. And that will carry us, you know, if Zillow decides to turn us off tomorrow, we're okay. We're not standing yeah. on that one leg, right? Yeah. And, um, and so we encourage our agents, listen, you know, you're going to come in first year in the business with us and you're going to be on the machine you're going to need to fill your pipeline after mm-hmm. about two to three years you should be 50 percent repeat referral Absolutely. and and we're, we've built a business together mm-hmm. if we have constant turn and burn with agents you never get to that you know it's they're more profitable right those business mm-hmm. businesses more comfortable more profitable you know you never get there you're it's always going out the back door so Absolutely. you know you've got to you got to protect that database and and protect those relationships and and when you have that evidence of, of success you become attractive you know if if people aren't leaving that that's attractive Absolutely yeah. something good there right and so we you know people just show up the right people at the right time seem to show up for us That's awesome yeah i mean 32 people over 5 years i mean that's insane you don't hear too many organizations to kind of have that longevity with agents and staff. So yeah. congratulations, you're definitely like, doing something right. Thanks. We have like 15 agents that sell 10 million or more. I mean, we have $30 million. Produ- I mean, like they're, they're producing, right? And they're happy and they have a life. And I think that's what's mm-hmm. attractive. It's like they can do it and still have a life where, you know, to do 30 million on your own and do all of the parts, you don't really have much of a life. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It sounds like your organization is set up kind of similar to ours where, you know, we always look at it as like the agents and staff, they're allowing myself, my wife, Rose, to live our life and, and accomplish all our dreams and goals. So we, in turn, want to reciprocate that. How can we do that? What are you passionate about? What are your goals? What, you know, is this a stepping stone? Do you plan to do something else? Is it, you know, are you looking to get investments and talk about investing in real estate or where do you want to go? So we do try to think of it as more of just where I think most teams or brokerages do just like how much revenue are you kind of bringing in the organization? Like, Hey, how can we impact your life? You're helping us accomplish our goal. We want to in return, do the same. And I think that's what allows you to kind of keep the people for you for a while where they're not looking for other opportunities because they know you're vested and you do care, which honestly, most people I think take for granted because I think a lot of people don't care, you know, Hey, if they don't make it, they, everybody has personal struggles, right? But a lot of people take that life aspect if they have health issues or financially struggling, personal issues, whatever it might be. And it's like, well, we still need you to produce. And I think, you know, it sounds a lot like you're like us, where you humanize that and you care and you're compassionate about your people and don't just look at them as a paycheck. Right. hundred percent. I mean, we've, we've got 
loans out. We have we've uh, we underwrite their their home purchases so they can write cash offers. You know, I mean, like we are we're we're like we do life with our our team. <laughs> That's do. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So I guess, um, and talking about that for the biggest strength and, you know, something that your organization really excels at, I don't want to say weakness, um, that's a negative connotation, but what would you think right now, the biggest bottleneck or hurdle you're experiencing um, in your real estate brokerage and something that, you know, you're looking to kind of work on and correct this year? Conversion. Conversion. Conversion, conversion. conversion. The leads are getting more and more expensive. Um, you know, before it was kind of okay to just cherry pick off the top. And um, we are, we are doubling down on mastery of conversion. Um, and the, you know, our agents don't love the conversion piece of it. They just don't, they mm -hmm. want to be handed an A buyer. They're, they're top of their game and they will do such a good job, you know, taking that A buyer and, and closing, right? The follow up and nurture it when you have an abundance of leads tends to not happen. Let's just be honest. Right? So we're we're struggling to figure out: Do you invest in that follow up, or do you continue to just cherry pick off the top? Or you know what can we do just to turn it up one degree and convert just a little bit more? Little it would more. probably move the needle quite a bit. So mm -hmm. um, we're working on you know, just how to bring value to people have that who have put their hands up and asked to, you know, for help in real estate. Um, and, you know, how can we get to people faster? And, um, and then, you know, whether that's going to be our agents answering the phones or ISAs, we're kind of working through that. But conversion is a big focus for us this year. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, as we're the market so I don't say market the industry is so quickly evolving like expectations the bar keeps getting raised so obviously I know a lot of people you know who aren't as passionate about conversion and trying to figure it out I think you know a lot of us are in that same journey and the ones who do figure it out are the ones who are going to win because it's you know it's kind of like a game a cat and mouse game where you're constantly trying to figure out what's going to work what where can you add value you don't have a relationship with these people but how can you build that and establish that and it's just a lot of trial and error. And then as new technology rolls out, you got to learn that, implement that. And it's never any change, but I think definitely implementing that and then, you know, working on that conversion is where I see a lot of the big players as their focus point, especially for the people I've been speaking with. So, yeah, I mean, we have to, I mean, it's just too expensive. I mean, really right now we're not even making money on like our aggregate leads. I mean, we're just, those are loss leaders for us and mm -hmm. the money is made in repeat and referrals. If we make sure we give amazing service um i mean it's just hard to make money on these leads right now there's just they're just too expensive with the cost yeah absolutely yeah. i completely agree and then the commissions, you know like there there's compression out there so you know 35 percent off the commission was great when we were getting three <laughs> percent yeah <laughs> yeah and then it was two and a half now i'm seeing a lot of two out there so right i mean it's just getting yeah. harder and harder so um i mean that's something we're gonna have to to keep an eye on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we all are. Um, as far as, you know, to kind of transition a little way from real estate, I know your background obviously was uh, teaching. That's what you started off in Houston. And it sounded like it, you know, you weren't too passionate about it. Your kind of heart was in uh, something else, which ended up finding in real estate. If you, looking back though, if you say you weren't in real estate now, um, and it doesn't have to be teacher, even though you chose it then, what, what do you think your career path would have been if you were to kind of redo it and real estate wasn't an option? I'd be selling something. So I, to Eskimo. I mean, I don't know. Like that's what <laughs> Salt to a slug. <laughs> I'm, I'm a one trick pony. I mean, like yeah. no matter what, no matter what test you put in front of me, as far as a behavior test, I am a one trick pony. So mm -hmm. I am only influence ideas. That's it. Um, and so, you know, I would be a hot mess if I were to have to be somewhere that required me to be, you know, a checklist driven or diligent every day or follow a, 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 a routine. I mean, I would die. I need, I, I just, I would be selling. I need flexibility and I need um, to sell. I mean, that's yeah. really, I, I, there's no other way. I do love teaching though. I have a big servant heart. I people helping people is my why it's my motivation i i you know i've never done this for the money i haven't touched a check in 20 years um but i i 
I would either be teaching or selling something, but I'd have to yeah. believe in the product. Just bringing value to people is what it sounds 100%. like. And be invested. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. And for, lastly, I guess for any agent out there who's newly licensed or maybe an agent who is, has been doing it for a while, but might be struggling, what would be your one tidbit or information you give to them? Like what would be your one aha that could possibly allow them to gain traction out the gate, or if they're struggling with something, maybe turn their business around and start to get into heavier production. Yeah. You know, out of the gate, I think that they need to get positioned well and that meaning into a, an organization that offers really good hands-on training and follow-up with them and coaching. Um, mm -hmm. They should position themselves next to mentors um, because they won't know all the answers and they're going to need to have, you know, somebody to rely on and to get um, constructive feedback from. But then they have to go do it. There's no better way to learn this business than going and face planning. And, and you're not going to get paid on every activity you do in this business, but you will learn every time. So, you know, you just have to have enough at bats to learn and, and you know, score. So, um, I would, you know, it's, it's about where you put yourself first. It's not about how much commission you can make out of the gate. Like you, zero is zero of zero, you know? So mm -hmm. it's about learning and getting that help and um, getting to mastery as fast as possible. And, you know, so they, you know, you got to get, if you're a new agent, you got to get around inventory because that's the mm -hmm. mousetrap. You, know, right. you got to go sit in open houses because nobody's going to land at your house or at the office. They're going to come to a house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you got to do something on purpose to go get listings, whether that's farming or networking or whatever that may be. You got to add to your database. And in the meantime, you're you're taking the leftover leads from other agents in the office and, you know, trying to, to learn with real people, you know, mm -hmm. with support and mentorship. So wherever that is, if that's a team environment or just a brokerage with some mentorship or that, I mean, it's just all about where you position yourself first to, if you're going to have success and then you, you gotta, you know, invest in yourself. You gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta put the time in and you're, you're building a new business. If you were going to start any business, you're going to put a hundred hours a week in. like mm -hmm. you're not going to build a business in 10 hours a week. Part time. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like your big takeaway is the alignment. It's that proper alignment and to make sure they have the tools and resources necessary to kind of get where they want to go. And then obviously make sure that, you know, the culture and the core values of the organization are kind of aligned with them. Because obviously, if you're not in the beliefs, um, you know, of the company you're working for, you're probably not going to be too passionate about it and not have that success. So not only aligning with somebody who provides these resources, but also aligning with somebody who shares similar mindset, beliefs, and all that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Awesome. Well, Jenny, for any buyer or seller looking to purchase or sell in the Orlando market or any agent who might be looking for a possible career change or a newly licensed agent looking to onboard with a brokerage in the area, uh, why don't you provide the listeners with your contact information on how they can reach you? Great. Well, it's easy to find because there aren't a lot of Weemerts out there. So Weemert is <laughs> W-E-M-E-R-T. Um, and you, my cell phone is right on my Facebook page in my, um, in, in the, whatever that header is, because I, I, I hate trying to find contact information for agents yes. when I want to refer. So um, I am not a secret agent. It's easy to Google, but we're Weimert Group Realty. I'm Jenny Weimert. And um, you can friend me on Facebook and you can find my contact information and we welcome agent to agent referrals. We'll take good care of your clients and your client won't be placed with like a brand new agent. You're going to get the top experienced agent. So awesome. And we'll also post it um, on when we post this podcast, kind of we'll post all your information on the social media sites and all that good stuff. So that way they can find you as well. And it will be just a click away. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. the opportunity. Our pleasure. Thanks for being a guest on the Real Estate Podcast. I definitely learned a lot. I'm sure our audience did as well. And we're grateful for your time. Thanks, Joe. Take Thank care. Bye-bye. <laughs>